This video is made possible thanks to my patrons, with special recognition to my upper-level patrons, Cameron Stevens, Riley Lang, and John Buck. If you'd like access to content from all of my channels up to a month in advance of airing on YouTube, head on over to patreon.com slash echoworm and pledge as little as $3 a month. In the meantime, if you're a fan of this sort of thing, be sure to like, share, subscribe, and any other buzzwords you can think of to see more content on the channel. My wife and I recently sat down to watch the new Disney Plus adaptation of Percy Jackson and the Olympians, a show which I, like many fans of the original series of novels, have been waiting for excitedly since as early as the failed Sea of Monsters film adaptation in 2013. Apart from a few questionable production choices, decisions on where to end episodes, and most significantly, the pacing between certain scenes when compared to their book counterparts, both my wife and I found the series a well-intended and well-delivered adaptation of the source material, especially when compared to the previous film series. As someone who has read the series front to back several times, and now actually get paid to do so, there were a handful of changes that distracted me as the series went along. For one, there was the design and look of the camp. The cabins are out in the open in the novels, and them being hidden in a forest in the show was enough of a change to make me notice. Most obviously, however, came with the introduction of virtually every other main character in the book, with the question I found myself asking subconsciously at the end of the first episode being, why is Annabeth black? Apart from Percy, his mother, and Mr. D, who is actually portrayed by an ethnically Greek actor, virtually every other main character at Camp Half-Blood is noticeably different from their description in the books. Annabeth is black, Grover is Indian, Luke is recognizably part Asian, and most distracting to me, Clarice is attractive. The only recolored casting I didn't think twice about was Mr. Bruner. For whatever reason, the racial ambiguity works rather well for centuries-old beings, where trivial issues such as racism and discrimination should be among the least of their worries. This is partly why I found the idea of the only ethnic Greek in the show's main cast portraying one of the immortal characters rather ironic. Now, I want to be clear. I don't think the changing of a character's race is detrimental to the quality of a program. I'm also not one of those people who are crying for roles of color to be equally recast for the benefit of white actors. In a show like Percy Jackson, where the source material was not just religiously examined, but the original author played a close creative role in the series, the changing of a character's race is insignificant to the overall narrative being told. Someone like me can certainly be distracted by what few are continuing to describe as a bastardization of the source material, but one could argue Rick Riordan has already been making such changes with the diversification of his own characters within the novel's universe. In the sequel series, issues of race, discrimination, and cultural background are not just significant, but consequential for the main characters of Frank, Leo, Hazel, and Piper. Even Nico D'Angelo, one of the most prolific characters in the extended series, is revealed to be gay in the ninth book. If you're going to criticize the show for being excessively diverse, you may want to familiarize yourself with the source material. By the time I reached the end of the second episode, I was more distracted by the logistics of transporting a standard wheelchair across the camp, which is noticeably lacking a paved surface. Rather, the noteworthiness of the race-swapped characters sparked an internal debate about force diversity. When it works, and when it really doesn't. Now, I want to be clear before we go any deeper. I am white. My wife is white. My kids, my parents, and my grandparents are all white. This video is not some feeble attempt to protect my race against a perceived woke mob. If anything, I just wanted to get a dialogue going about the complexities of racial diversity in casting and what self-identification means in relation to race-swapped characters. Race is probably the greatest example of human identification characteristics. You can argue day and night about the idea that in order to abate racism you need to ignore it, but that argument completely ignores the fact that racism has, in fact, existed for hundreds if not thousands of years, and ignoring it completely trivializes and diminishes the hardships, fights, and triumphs that oppressed peoples have encountered because of racism. If you were to make a movie about World War II and recast Eisenhower to be black, you not only change something that makes little sense in the greater narrative, but trivialize the events surrounding actual black soldiers during this time, who dealt not only with having to fight a war, but fight a war for a country that did not reward them to the same level as their white counterparts. One of the biggest perceived factors in opposition to the increased diversity in Hollywood is an apparent lack of racial and ethnic identity, which is felt by the majority of white Americans. A side effect of living in a melting pot is that over time, ethnic and historical differences are ignored because of something like race. Most of my friends are ethnically German, but because their families have been in the United States so long and are removed from their centuries-old traditions, they either have none or equate their own traditions with those of a greater American tradition, equally as influenced by the centuries-old cultures of Britons, Spaniards, Italians, etc. 
Part of why the idea of a white nationalist America is such a political white elephant is that if such a society were to be reached, you either have to exclude the traditions of new equally white cultures, which in turn negates the whole concept of a master race, or you accept these changes and change your own, at which point the original cultural bases for said society reveal themselves as a nothing burger. In the last 10 years, I've realized that culturally, my background doesn't quite fit into the same category as most white Americans. I'm only a third generation citizen, which compared to most other Americans of Western European origin is rather young. I don't self-identify as white. Generally, I'm Norwegian. I understand Norwegian. My home cuisine is Norwegian. I fly the Norwegian flag on the 17th of May every spring. There are Mexican and Chinese families who have been in this country twice as long as mine and have lost their cultural traditions and identity, whereas my family can very easily be traced back to where they came from. My mother's side came through Ellis Island in the early 20th century, whereas my dad's side made their way here through England and Canada by way of a few centuries stuck in Normandy. Because of my origins, I think my perspective on the idea of racial identity differs significantly from the majority of those who typically criticize the race swapping of originally white characters. Like I just mentioned, the traditional ideas of ethnic and cultural origins have been lost on most white Americans in the grander scope of race, which is why the ethnic changing of a character like Percy Jackson from a Jewish actor into one of English origin goes completely unnoticed, as does the change of Percy's book-accurate hair color from the films to the TV show. It's also why the recasting of Grover this time around was less impactful. Despite being described as ginger in the books, his race swap already happened with the first set of films, so the concept of him being a non-white character was already acceptable to the audience. In the film Night at the Museum, criticism was leveled at the casting of Rami Malek as the Pharaoh. It was considered by some outlets as being the latest case of Hollywood whitewashing, because the Pharaoh didn't look Arab enough. Ignoring the historical fact that nearly every pharaoh of note was not of Egyptian origin, but a mess of Assyrian, Babylonian, Persian, and later Greek, they failed to recognize that Rami Malek is in fact an ethnic Egyptian. They also failed to notice that the obviously English actor Steve Coogan was portraying a character who is notably Italian. Part of why race swapping exists in the first place is to diversify the cast for a wider target audience, at the expense of changing an already existing and profitable IP. One of the most notable examples in recent years has been the portrayal of Princess Ariel in The Little Mermaid, originally a white ginger character recast to a performance by black actress Halle Bailey a move which caused a wave of criticism in both good and bad faith. The most common argument against the casting was that the story is of Danish origin, and therefore the character should obviously remain white. I myself would argue that among Disney's roster of princesses, Ariel is probably the easiest character to change. Keep in mind the character is already a mermaid. The changing of a half-fish from having white skin to black does very little to affect the narrative and authenticity of the story. All of the non-white princesses can't be swapped, their character backgrounds and motivations are intrinsically linked with their respective cultures. With the other European princesses, as seems to be the case for the upcoming Snow White adaptation, the swapping of race does not work for a variety of reasons, both narratively and historically. For example, most European nations had literal clauses in their constitutions barring ethnic and cultural minorities from holding positions of power. If a practicing Catholic couldn't become England's prime minister until the year 2019, then Rachel Ziegler's Snow White most certainly could not be a princess. On a side note, this is why the diversity in Bridgerton is so outrageous, and almost downright insulting to the thousands of persecuted minorities who live during the British Regency. Scripted diversity can affect a story in two major ways. Does it affect the narrative, and does it affect the authenticity? Take for example three of my most famous ancestors, all of whom came together in the year 1066 to battle over the vacant English crown. If you were to make a film about the battles of Samford Bridge and Hastings, and you decided to diversify the cast, what would its impact be on the overarching story? In the case of Harold Godwinson, it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense narratively to make him black unless you also made the entire country black. Harold was famously the last English king of England, and therefore in order to align him with that specific narrative, you have to match him with the people over whom he reigns. On the other hand, you could make him biracial. Harold had both family ties to the English and the Vikings, so narratively, the identity of two separate races coming together in the form of one man with split loyalties does fit the narrative. However, this would then force you to make all of the Danish and Viking characters black as well, including the invader Harold Hardrada, which again forces you to race swap an entire culture, while at the same time potentially demonizing the entire black cast as an invading force of ruthless barbarians, which, when I put it like that, seems more racist than just not having a diverse cast. The character for whom it actually does work narratively in this case is William the Conqueror. 
Having no ties to England, his conquest of the country resulted in the virtual extinction of traditional English culture. His complete rewriting of the country on behalf of an entirely different ethnic group could very easily be shown to a modern audience in the form of a race swap, which also provides an interesting storytelling opportunity with William being ostracized and an illegitimate child who, even until his death, was seen by nearly every person outside Normandy as an outsider. This works very well narratively, but is obviously historically inaccurate. William the Conqueror was white. Even if a race swap works within the confines of the story, it causes problems when the story is expanded through a greater lens. Returning to Bridgerton, is it possible, even likely, that Queen Charlotte had an African ancestor? Yes. The two things people who defend the casting fail to recognize are one, this ancestor was removed from Charlotte by 15 generations, meaning that only one of Charlotte's 32,000 great-grandparents was black, and two, how would a black queen respond in the abundance of legalized slavery underneath her rule? It's in these historical recastings that certain details are blown out of proportion for the sake of relayed identity. For example, as an American, we are taught that as part of our dark colonial history, Thomas Jefferson fathered children with one of his slaves. What they typically fail to mention is that Sally Hemings was not only just a quarter black, but by all historical accounts had fair skin and could pass as white. Another prominent example of narrative versus historical race swapping is in the Broadway musical Hamilton. Now, you would be hard pressed to find many people besides myself who think Hamilton isn't a great musical, but one of the most polarizing aspects of the show itself is in the diversified portrayals of American historical figures. The first question we should ask is, does a black version of Alexander Hamilton make sense? Narratively, yes. Though I would argue it would make far more sense if the rest of the cast were white. As the illegitimate child of an aristocratic Scotsman and a separately married woman who is a religious minority, making Hamilton black provides the audience with a visual sense of otherness from the cast, which makes even more sense given Hamilton's upbringing in the Caribbean prior to his moving to the United States. This visualization works significantly less when the near entirety of the cast is also a visual minority. In the case of these characters specifically, who are amongst the most visually recognizable in the history of the country, this is not only distracting to those of us familiar with the history being told, but visually confusing. This is made even worse with the changing of casts. When the musical made its first tour of the United States, Hamilton's casting was changed from a series of Hispanic actors to a series of black actors, which has no narrative significance. The whole idea of a diversified cast was, according to Lin-Manuel Miranda, to look like America looks now. In other words, the change serves no real purpose to the narrative and completely trivializes the struggles of race during the time period and the years beyond. If the point of the story is to allow modern audiences and students to better connect with these historical figures, it's at the expense of cleansing these characters of their roles, whether positive or negative, in the very systems that make something like race swapping necessary. Another example of distracting race swapping, and the one that actually got my head spinning even before Percy Jackson, came in a recent episode of Doctor Who. Doctor Who has a complicated history with the subject of race, most notably in infamous whitewashing moments of the 60s and 70s, but also as recently as 2007, where the Doctor rather famously tells his first black companion to forget about the fact she's black while in Elizabethan England, a time in which the Queen declared it legal to arrest black immigrants on sight and sell them into Spanish slavery. The most recent example comes in the second of David Tennant's 60th anniversary specials, which aired this last December. In said episode, Sir Isaac Newton, famed developer of the law of gravity and calculus, appears for a brief few minutes portrayed by an Indian actor. The reason this is so bothersome to most viewers isn't necessarily the swap itself, but the fact that it serves no narrative purpose whatsoever. Newton's inclusion in the episode could be cut entirely without any detrimental effect on the rest of the episode. In fact, it's not until another character directly names Isaac Newton that most of the audience is able to register who this character is, because much like Hamilton, this very famous and typically identifiable character is unrecognizable even in costume because of said race swap. Diversity only really seems to work without controversy when the characters in question aren't already well established, real person or not. Black Panther and Crazy Rich Asians garnered enormous appeal with diverse casts because they told unique and traditionally marginalized stories, which were able to appeal to a massive audience because the diversity came at no expense of a previously established IP. This also works for a character like Nick Fury, who prior to Samuel L. Jackson's portrayal of the character in Iron Man was always portrayed as white. Because the character was relatively unknown to wider audiences at this point, the change was easier to make. 
A time when this didn't work was in the casting of Hermione Granger in the stage play sequel to Harry Potter, Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, in which the character is portrayed by a black actress. The outrage from this was vast, mainly because audiences had fallen in love with Emma Watson's portrayal of the character, which happened in one of the highest grossing film franchises of all time. Believe it or not, I'm actually going to defend this casting. Not only does this fit narratively with Hermione's character, it almost fits her character better than being white. As someone who has read the Harry Potter books cover to cover nearly half a dozen times, Hermione is so rarely described in terms of her skin color that one could be forgiven for reading the moments of her having a white face as a metaphor. The important bits of Hermione's physical character are that she has bushy hair and buck teeth, neither of which is negated by her being black. All we know of her backstory is that her parents are dentists and she frequently vacations in France, neither of which is negated by her being black, and the latter of which actually works in the race swap's favor if you're even slightly aware of the history of French colonial immigration. Most pressingly, and the one major factor in why you wouldn't be able to race swap a character like Harry or Ron over Hermione, is that Hermione is already the target of extreme racism on account of her muggle-born status. Not only is this made more topical with a race swap, but it would also account for how well she takes said racism in the first place, and the way she's able to respond to it and push for radicalized racial change at the end of the story. The race swap would also give Hermione's liberal agenda less of a white savior feeling. Hermione is very obviously the self-insert character for author J.K. Rowling, and her excursions on behalf of House Elf Rights, where she repeatedly uses the phrase, they don't know what they really want, comes across far less gratingly if she is changed from being a white female. If there is a shift in diversity for the casting of the upcoming Harry Potter TV series, not only will I accept the casting of a black Hermione, I will defend it. Where race swapping can work effectively in the narrative, even in historical fiction, it only really works with historical authenticity when completely removed from our world. Yes, Luke Skywalker being recast as a black character would spark outrage because of the 50-year established recognizability of his character, but in the greater scope of the historical authenticity, human racism plays absolutely zero role in the established main stories of the Star Wars universe, so you could certainly get away with it. An example of sci-fi race swapping working inconsequentially is in the recent remake of Frank Herbert's Dune, where the original red-haired character Chaney, portrayed by white actresses in previous adaptations, was recast into Zendaya Coleman, who's biracial. Even in a world like Dune, where the family lineages, racial identity, and planet of origin for characters are important in the grander scheme of the narrative, this works on account of this specific character's identification as a Fremen. The Fremen are a cultural diaspora, not a racial or ethnic one. One of the greatest race swaps I have ever seen, which, mind you, was not without its own criticism, comes from Game of Thrones prequel series House of the Dragon, a show which I will unwaveringly praise until it ultimately lets me down like the original. If you're familiar with House of the Dragon, or the greater Game of Thrones universe as a whole, the world in which it's placed is famously one of the most overdeveloped worlds in fiction history. The country in which it takes place contains five very distinct ethnic groups and various mixes within, which doesn't account for the innumerable other races which exist in other countries and continents. Each great house in Westeros, regardless of ethnicity, has a very distinct look and attitude toward the rest of the world. Because the world is so expansive and overly diverse within a vast array of individual ethnicities, racial diversity does not exist in Westeros. The country, despite its ethnic diversity, is completely white. Like our own history of the ancient world, white people occupy the western extremes of this world. Black people occupy the south. Brown people inhabit the Near East. In the very Far East, the world is implied to have an analogous Asian culture. The world even has its own version of nomadic Mongols. Because of how faithful these ethnic ties were portrayed in the original show, there was very little room for the prequel series to allow for a more diverse cast. But in the smallest loophole, a triumph of racially swapped casting fit into not only the world's historical authenticity, but fit so seamlessly into the show's narrative, it's a wonder the series author George R.R. R. Martin didn't think of it himself. The story of House of the Dragon is taken from a select section of a Game of Thrones prequel book called Fire and Blood. If you're familiar with Game of Thrones, the prequel tells the story of the ancestors of Daenerys Targaryen, the mother of dragons from the original show, during a time when their power and influence was at its greatest height. The Targaryen family come from a now extinct part of the world called Valyria, which was destroyed in a massive compilation of natural disasters. The great history and influence of Valyria, and its people, are mainly lost to the world except to legend, and in the very few remaining Valyrian families that now exist as outcasts in the rest of the world. Because their home was lost, the Targaryens, who have the genetic ability to bond with and ride dragons, use their power to invade and conquer the neighboring continent of Westeros, where the majority of the series and its spin-off material takes place. 
The Targaryens are arguably only powerful in Westeros because of their dragons, which is why after their dragons eventually die out, the citizens of the realm rise up in rebellion and overthrow the powerful outsiders. It's very obvious in the books, a bit less so in the show, how otherworldly these Targaryens, and to a greater extent the ethnic Valyrians, are in comparison to the other ethnic groups in Westeros. Apart from their white hair, which was diminished to blonde in the original show, they have purple eyes, distinctly sharp features, and almost translucent skin. Even though it wouldn't match their descriptions in the books, a visual sense of otherness between the Valyrians and the Westerosi could have been portrayed by making the Valyrians a different race. However, because the audience was already familiarized with the Targaryens by way of Amelia Clark, it would have been a significant challenge to sway the audience to a Targaryen race swap without it being noticeable and distracting. The solution came then in the installation and reveal of a second Valyrian family, the Valarians. The Valarians exist in the original book series, but are rarely if ever seen in the narrative, and so they are completely absent from the original show. However, they play a crucial role in House of the Dragon, and so their inclusion allowed the showrunners and casting directors to employ a race swap without attracting notable change to the original visual series. Of course, there was backlash. There always is with these sorts of things. In the books, the Valarians, like the Targaryens, are described as having similar features. White hair, purple eyes, bright skin. But because of the lore within the show, where diverse characteristics already exist within the well-established ethnic groups, on top of the fact that the history of Valyria is shrouded in myth and legend, so something like the full racial diversity wouldn't be known in an otherwise well-developed world. On top of the fact that the Valarian family are well known as a seafaring people, specifically to places in this world where black populations are abundant, it makes sense in the visual world of the show that the Valarian family could be black, which also helps them stand out against the rather extensive main cast of Targaryen characters. Most perfectly, however, is how this fits into one of the primary plots of the show. The protagonist, Rhaenyra Targaryen, is wed in both the show and the books to her Valarian cousin, Laenor, though the pair show nearly no interest in one another on account of Laenor being gay. Because of this, their three children are fathered not by Laenor, but by Sir Harwin Strong. Not only does Rhaenyra's infidelity threaten a fragile political atmosphere in the future succession, it's also an open secret. By flaunting the very existence of her children and not acknowledging their true parentage, she is regularly showing everyone else in the kingdom that because she's the heir to the throne, she can get away with anything. In the books, it's very obvious that everyone knows Laenor isn't the father. The kids all look like the spitting image of Harwin Strong, and having zero Valyrian features, as would be the case with two Valyrian parents. However, to a contemporary audience which normally isn't able to recognize the difference between different ethnicities of a single race, such as English with German, especially when the only noticeable characteristic of the Valyrians in the show is a blonde wig, changing the entire race of the Valarians makes it that much more obvious that these aren't Laenor's children. Not only that, but the fact that Rhaenyra continues to recognize her children as legitimate tells everyone else that even in the most obvious lie imaginable, Rhaenyra does not care what lesser people think of her, which is why when her reign finally devolves into civil war, the lesser people of Westeros do not help her support her claim. It's a perfect example of race swapping not only fitting with the context of both narrative and authenticity, but actively benefiting the storytelling in question as well. Back to the topic of Percy Jackson, I don't think the swapping of the characters' races is that detrimental to the show, except on what I would describe as a distracting level. Annabeth is over and over again described in the books as having blonde hair, so to someone like me who is extremely detail-oriented, even something like Alexandra Daddario's dark hair in the films was enough to make me question if I was even watching the same characters I knew and loved. That being said, it will change the character if the topic of race and racism is encountered in a way separate to how it is in the source material. Annabeth is driven by the desire to be recognized by her mom and accepted into her father's new family, which doesn't work the same narratively in the books. It's never stated outright, but there's an undertone in the books that because her stepmother is Asian, Annabeth struggles to fit in with her stepbrothers not just because she's a half-blood, but because they look physically different than she does. And in overcoming her distrust of her stepmother and her children, also overcomes a subconscious villainization of people who, despite having her best interests at heart, are not just different from her on a human level, but on a racial level as well. As of me writing this script, we have not seen Annabeth's parents on screen. If Dr. Chase and Athena are both black, then this narrative only works if Annabeth's stepmom is not. If Dr. Chase is black and Athena is not, then this narrative only works if Athena and Annabeth's stepmom look nothing alike. And if Athena is black and Dr. Chase is not, 
This entire racial identity arc has the exact opposite narrative effect and could potentially demonize a set of characters who are revealed to be non-hostile in the book simply based on the idea of subconscious racial biases. But that's all I got to say. What do you think? Is race swapping positive or negative in the world of visual media, or is it, like I hopefully outlined in this video, a less binary issue? Do you still feel like you're watching your favorite characters? Let me know in the comments section below. Until next time, we will see you very, very soon.